When I say he's shot in the chest, he is shot in the chest. He's, he's dead. Hi, I'm Hosman17. This is my pop culture backlog. Hosman17 here. Thanks again for coming back to TPB TBT. That's Trade Paperback Throwback Thursday, where I dig through some of my old books and I give them a reread. Today we're looking at Captain America, The Winter Soldier. So this book was uh, Captain America Volume 5, Issues 1 through 7. Came out in, I think, 2005. Written by Ed Brubaker with art by Steve Epting. His name was indeed Steve. You can see from the cover over here, it was called Out of Time, but when the trade paperback came out, they decided to go with the Winter Soldier. So we start five years ago where a new character, Alexander Lucan, is meeting the Red Skull, and they're doing some sort of arms deal for these old KGB weapons. Uh, they are caught and intercepted right away by the, uh, the Red Guardian, but he's... Uh, He's easily dispatched and shot in the head. Uh, don't need to feel bad. He was like the fifth, I believe, Red Guardian, and there's at least been two more since, so, I mean, we're not going to cry for that guy. The Skull and Lucan start doing some negotiating over what the weapons are or whatever, and then Red Skull comes across this guy, and this mysterious stranger floating in a cryogenic tube, and he's like, oh, that's interesting, I want that. And then Lucan's like, well, you can't have that. I mean, he's not really for sale. I got plans for that. Unless you're maybe going to give me the, uh, the Cosmic Cube. And the Red Skull's like, can't do it. I don't have it, and even if I did, you're not getting it. You can keep dreaming. My spies are coming to the world for signs of it even as we speak. And the cube, it will be mine, and no one else's. And when that day comes, the whole world will know fear, General, like you've never seen. So we jump ahead five years to the present day, and we find out that the Red Skull now does in fact have the Cosmic Cube back in his possession, and he has plans for it. But this book isn't about the Red Skull, it's about Captain America, so let's see what he's up to. We jump over there and we run into Cap and we learn right away things are quite different. Uh, the Avengers disassembled, this was right after the whole disassembled thing. Hawkeye's dead, like a lot of his friends are dead. And we see that he is, he's very different. He's beating up these guys on a train and he's not really holding back. He's not reluctant to kill anybody either. It's showing more that he, he's the soldier. He's not a superhero, he is a soldier. He is on mission. He's got things to do and nothing's going to stop him from carrying out that mission. Uh, and Sharon Carter's his new S.H.I.E.L.D. liaison, and she's giving him some crap about how he took down a helicopter. She's like, it was lucky it landed in a river, and Captain America's like, it wasn't luck. It wasn't luck, and it wasn't reckless. It got the job done. And honestly, I feel like with one throw of his S.H.I.E.L.D., Captain America could take out a helicopter and make sure that it does land in the river. Like, I think he's that good. But Sharon does notice, just like we readers did, that Cap is a little more on edge. Uh, she even comments that he's been more violent and more on edge since the uh, Red Skull escaped prison about a month ago. And speaking of the Red Skull, we learn that he does know where Captain America is, and he's been watching him for a while. He could take him out at any moment, he says, but he doesn't want that. He wants Captain America to suffer, and he's got huge plans that are going to do just that. And then Red Skull gets a phone call, and it's our old friend Alexander Lucan again. And he's calling, saying, hey, I hear you got that, uh, hear you got that cosmic cube. Maybe I can uh, buy it from you? The Red Skull says no, and is immediately shot in the chest and killed by some mysterious stranger who goes, picks up the cube, and tells Lucan, yeah, we got it. So. so the next issue starts off uh, right where the first one left off. And Crossbones is down in the sewer ready to detonate that bomb and blow up Manhattan. But at the same time, Steve is waking up from a nightmare he's having about World War II and Bucky. Only the nightmare didn't quite match up with his memories. Things were a little different and he's not sure why. Of course, there's no time to worry about that because old Nick Fury's on the phone. He's got to call Captain America in to come confirm that the dead body they just found is in fact the Red Skull. Uh, <laughs> you know, they need to get some DNA samples because... the at that time, the Red Skull was a clone of Captain America. It's a whole thing. Um, but Captain America, of course, is like, no, nah, it's a trick. He doesn't believe for a second that that's the real Red Skull. He thinks it's some sort of trick. He's wrong, though. Red Skull's dead. Like, there's a hole in his chest. They do a little bit of investigating, and they find out about the whole bomb scheme, and Cap races down to the sewers and takes out this goon squad pretty easily. So he takes out the goons, and he stops the bomb, but Crossbones actually runs away. And makes a call, says, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Red Skull's dead, but go ahead with the plan anyway. Blow up London, blow up Paris. Cap and Sharon are racing across to Paris to go save the day there, while their London team is going to go intercept that bomb. I don't know why they couldn't call a team in Paris. I guess La Peregrine was busy. The boy Union Jack here is part of the British team, and he heads down to the sewers to find the Red Skull's team and, and Mother Knight, like a major character at one point in time. They're all dead, completely dead, and the bomb is gone. Bloody hell, someone slotted all of them. Right, give us a recon of the area. See if any of these geezers are still breathing. And please tell me that bleeding firebomb is down here someplace. In my head, that sounded like Jason Statham, and I was going to be like, hashtag Jason Statham for Union Jack in the MCU, but uh, out loud it didn't sound like him at all, so don't worry about it. 
Cap and Sharon, however, have a little more luck in Paris. They quite easily take out an AIM team and secure the third bomb. So Fury gives them the night off. And Captain America reminisces about the war, of all things, World War II. No, honestly, this 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 book really kind of changes the way World War II is looked at, I think, in the comics. It could have happened somewhere else along the way. But World War II was always this colorful, fun... <laughs> as far as comics were concerned, it was like, these are superheroes, they're having fun, there's stuff. But this book really takes it back to war. Like, there are plenty of flashbacks, and they don't shy away from having corpses littering the streets and just talking about how dirty and gritty war really was. And honestly, I kind of like that. It's still... You still have... Human Torch and Namor and Captain America flying around, but at the same time, it does bring in the realism, which is actually something like, like I was saying earlier, this book really reinforces Captain America as a soldier first. Cap goes on talks about how he really respects the French soldiers. We're talking about a people who never gave up fighting the Nazi occupation. Their country may have surrendered, but they didn't. I saw men and women, civilians, take on panzer divisions, knowing that their own loved ones would be slaughtered in retribution by the Nazis. That's why it really galls me when I hear my own people dismissing the French as cowards. Huh, I wonder if that could be in reference to anything in particular. You think this letter on my forehead stands for France? Uh, and at the very end of the issue, back in America, we see uh, this drunk guy in a bar that we learn is Jack Monroe, uh, one of Cap's former partners, Nomad now. Uh, he goes outside and he is murdered by a mysterious stranger and thrown in the trunk of a car. Issue 4 is a very iconic cover, I think. I feel like I've seen that cover all over the place. Right at the start, we get a little more of Lucan. We learn that he's actually quite the businessman. Uh, and one of his aides is warning him about the Cosmic Cube, and he delivers this great line. No good can come of it, I tell you. It is fitting, then, that I have nothing good planned for it. Such a good line. So Nick Fury sends Sharon out on an assignment to go investigate the murder of Jack Monroe. And for some reason, on the background, in a computer screen, he's got the Falcon on the screen. So therefore, I can justify tagging Falcon. Uh, but he's got something much more personal planned for Cap. Something much more personal. Uh, Cap's got to go look into some defaced gravestones. It seems that the graves of William Nasland and Jeffrey Mace have both been destroyed. Jeffrey Mace may be familiar to anyone who watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Maybe not. Uh, but William and Jeffrey both were people that took up the mantle of Captain America after World War II, when Cap went on ice. Uh, and that wasn't publicly known, so for someone to have smashed these two gravestones is kind of sending a personal signal to Stephen Rogers. Stephen Rogers. Captain America. So Steve leaves the graveyard, he's a little shaken up by everything, and he's starting to get more of these World War II flashbacks coming into his head, and he's still not sure why. And then Crossbones comes out of nowhere and really kind of wipes the floor with him. Like, Captain America puts up a bit of a fight, but really just doesn't get the chance to fight back. Um, it's just his head is too clouded, and Crossbones is like, I'm not going to kill you. Some Russian guy just called and told me where to find you today, but this, this is way too easy. I ain't taking you out like this. You tell that Russian, too. Tell him he's messed with the wrong hombre. So we check up on Sharon's progress. Turns out she found uh, where Jack's body was, but she gets knocked out by this same mysterious stranger that murdered him. So issue five takes us all the way back to the war. We get a good, pretty much whole flashback story. There is some more stuff in there that is tying into the whole story, but we're not going that deep into it here. Um, it goes really good, though. Um, like I said, when everything's trying to be realistic, like this, uh, the art style of this book is a realistic style of art, but it also embraces the, the marvelness of it, like, because it has to. This is a world where this stuff exists, so we have this very realistic war story, but at the same time, there are two guys on fire fighting a super-powered Nazi. Uh, I think it's, it's awesome. Uh, this one gave us a really good retcon as well that changed Bucky's character, and it actually makes a lot of sense. Which is the real secret of what Bucky was. The official story said he was a symbol to counter the rise of the Hitler Youth, and there was some truth to that. But like all things in war, there was a darker truth underneath. Bucky did the things I couldn't. I was the icon. I wore the flag. But while I gave the speeches to the troops in the trenches, he was doing what he'd been trained to do, and he was highly trained. He wouldn't have been out there with us if he wasn't. Bucky has been like the colorful teen sidekick. Uh, and this it establishes, but by the end of the war, Bucky was 21. So, I mean, he must have been 17 when he was the teen sidekick at the start. And he was a highly trained, he was an assassin. He was out there getting his hands dirty, doing the things Cap couldn't. Uh, even though, like, it, it was war. Captain America was a soldier. He was killing people. But, but, you know, Bucky was like this trained assassin. So issue six starts off. We have that same mysterious stranger we've been seeing, who, I mean, is obviously the Winter Soldier. Um, but we don't know who he is. 
He's setting up a bomb in Philadelphia. Uh, Captain America is actually taking off to Zemo's Island, where he fought his last battle of World War II to try and get some answers about these flashbacks. So when he gets there, he's following up on his memories. He starts having to fight some of these memories, and he sees right away that they aren't real, but he's like, well, the bullets felt real. Like, everything was real about it. And again, he deduces pretty quickly it was the Cosmic Cube, again, uh, messing with his... everything. Messing with his reality. But before too long, the Cosmic Cube gives him a vision of Sharon tied up and in need of help. So he hops back on the plane and flies back to Philadelphia to go free Sharon. Only when he gets there, he's in for a couple surprises. So he flies off to Philly, jumps out of the plane with a parachute, I might add, and lands just in time and he rips off her tape and she says, Cap, this guy that is hunting us down, I got a good look at him. I'm pretty sure he's Bucky. Yeah, so that kind of shakes Cap to his core, the thought that maybe it was Bucky because he's been having all these visions and everything of Bucky, but before he can really think about it too long, boom, <laughs> Philadelphia explodes. And that was the other bombshell that Sharon had to drop, not the literal bombshell, but the other one was like, this was all a plan, this was set up, they wanted you to be right here. Whoever this is wanted you to have a front row seat. And also, the uh, Cosmic Cube needed to be repowered by death for some reason, and it is <laughs> it is fully powered back up at this point. Issue 7 here is an interlude. It does say as soon as you open it up, it's an interlude, um, which is good. It's a good little story. It's about kind of the last times of Jack Monroe, and he is kind of losing his mind. But he thinks he's taking down some drug dealers, but he actually isn't. He's just beating up people that are selling ice cream outside of his daughter's school. It's a whole story. It's fine. Uh, but it ends with the panel we saw. Well, not the panel. New art. Uh, but it ends with what we saw earlier of him getting shot and thrown in a trunk of a car. Um, it's a fine little story. Uh, it's a nice addition into the graphic novel here. Graphic novel. Ugh. It's a fine addition into this trade paperback, but if I was reading this issue to issue back in 2005 and issue 7 after dropping those bombshells was this story about Jack Monroe, I'd be a little upset. <laughs> but like I said, it's, uh, crammed into the trade paperback, it fits just fine. It's good. Uh, so all in all, Captain America Volume 5, issues 1 through 7, Out of Time, or as they repackage it here, The Winter Soldier, uh, it's a really good read. Ed Brubaker knows what he's doing. He's doing a really good job of setting up the world and establishing everything. Uh, he's doing a really good job of having like the spies and soldiers stuff keep being really grounded but still in a world where you can have all the superpowers and the flying cars and everything that Marvel already has the art is fantastic um, like I said the story is really good and I will be back before too long with the Winter Soldier Volume 2 to keep this story rolling because honestly Having read that, I want to keep reading it, you know? I want to jump right in and keep going. So that's that's obviously a sign of a good story. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe and join me next time uh, when I keep rereading this stuff. Because, you know, you can't always afford to go buy new comics and everything, so sometimes it pays just to reread the old ones. I've been Hosman17. Thank you for hanging out. If you want to hang out some more, you can find me on Twitch. You can check me on Twitter. You can check me on TikTok. All the T's down in the link below. You can find those links. The links are down below. Over here, a couple of videos I did on Invincible. I got more stuff coming. There's plenty more down the pipe. I've got a lot of old comic books to get through. So thank you very much for listening to me talk about Captain America.